Welcome to our today's presentation about Ansible Automation Platform as a Service based on OpenShift. Today, my colleague Silva and I will show you how we at SIX use the AAP together with the customization uh, to provide a service for our internal developers so that they can really bootstrap uh, AAP on demand. So first of all, let me show what you can expect from today's session. So we will start with a quick introduction, followed by an explanation of the architecture of AAP2, as well as the basics of a Kubernetes operator, since it's quite important when we speak about uh, OpenShift that you also know this basic concept of operators. We will follow then by the bootstrap and configuration. That means how we enhance the basic operator so that it fits in our zero trust environment, as well as the execution environments, which goes then hand in hand. At the end, we will of course also show you how we migrated from the old approach, the Ansible Tower, to this new AAP on OpenShift. And um, to conclude this whole presentation, we will also show you then the challenges and the takeaways we had. But first of all, let me pass the mic over to my colleague Silva to introduce himself. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sylvain Chen. I'm a principal consultant at Red Hat. Uh, I joined in uh, 2017. It's my first DevConf. I'm very happy to be here. I've been working with containers for quite some years, as well as with uh, Ansible. And uh, I'm glad today to, uh, to present the work done uh, of my two favorite uh, uh, products, Ansible Automation Platform and OpenShift all together. I would like to uh, hand over back to, uh, to Philip, who will introduce himself. Thank you, Silva. So my name is Philip Hutter. I work as a Kubernetes engineer at SIX. For those who do not know what SIX is, um, SIX operates and develops uh, infrastructure as well as software for uh, financial services in Switzerland and in Spain. Therefore, also zero trust uh, is a must in our environment. Um, from my background, I'm working with content technology for quite a while now, for eight years. Uh, I started my automation journey with Puppet, now moving slightly um, bit for bit to Ansible. But as you may know, it's not that easy to let go someone's first love, right? So, but that's enough from the non-technical things. So let's move over to what we are, or why we are here now. So when we go back some years, when we introduced Ansible uh, in our company, we thought about deploying this Ansible automation platform, or there the name was, uh, then the name was Ansible Tower on OpenShift. It was supported that you can deploy Ansible Tower on OpenShift, but it was never supported to have an operator. Um, so officially supported by Red Hat. But we decided to go then or to use the upstream, the AWX operator already back in the days with OpenShift 3 to deliver a service to our internal employees, which had all these benefits like uh, self-service approach. They were able to, uh, to use infrastructure as code to deploy their instances. And due to the fact that it runs on OpenShift, you had like this consistent lifecycle automation in place. But now, with the move to OpenShift 4, Red Hat officially provides this Ansible automation platform operator, which is quite cool. So therefore, also with the move to OpenShift 4, we decided to take this official operator. But as you may know, it's not easy um, to just take something, put it in a zero trust environment, and then run it. So you also need some customization. That's uh, what we did, actually. But first things first. So I'll pass over back to Silva so that he can explain what benefits this AAP2 really has. Thank you, Philippe. So I will talk more about uh, AAP2, but first, what does it bring compared to Ansible Tower? So basically, we have the decoupling of Ansible uh, uh, automation platform in two parts. One is the uh, control plane, also called automation controller, and the second part is really the execution plane, where we will run the uh, user playbooks. So uh, this is really interesting in OpenShift because you can basically have, uh, have it running really in a microservice way. 
Uh, then regarding the dynamic uh, cluster capacity, you can really rely on OpenShift to support all the different playbooks and job templates as pods. Before it was not possible, everything was running from the same pod, and this, is what the, this was really the monolithic approach. Now, AAP2 is really bringing uh, things down and having like the microservice approach. On the bottom, you can see the automation mesh. This is to actually bridge uh, external VMs uh, from OpenShift. Uh, unfortunately, when you deploy AAP2 on, on OpenShift, at least on the version 2.3, uh, this is not yet uh, uh, GA uh, soon, I, I hope, but uh, at the moment, this is technology preview. So this is the, the difference when you run it on OpenShift as of today compared to uh, the traditional way. Obviously, people can do this uh, central management with uh, automation controller, and they can, you can have like different teams uh, using that independently from each other and having really uh, this uh, as a service. And we'll talk more about that uh, right now on how users can provision their own uh, AAP on OpenShift using operators. Uh, but first thing first, we need to explain what is a Kubernetes operator, and uh, Philip will explain that. Yeah, you mentioned it. OpenShift operator. If you just come from the Ansible environment, maybe operators are not um, the thing you're working on in the LDL base. But let me explain it. So here on this uh, slide, we see a normal OpenShift cluster, and on top, you see the API in etcd. So the API etcd is, or especially etcd, is where OpenShift stores all the state uh, from the running applications in it. So what is an operator? An operator is actually a piece of software running in a container, which you can use, or which you use to automate tasks. In this case, you see in the middle of this picture, you see the, just as an example, the Ansible Automation Platform operator. This operator has so-called reconciliation loops. So it constantly watches the state of the etcd, and when something changes in etcd, it will apply the changes to the cluster. And on the bottom line, you see the customer namespace. So, but how does it work now for the customer? How can a customer or an internal developer actually interact with, with this operator? So, there are the so-called custom resources. So, users can create custom resources to interact with this operator. And as soon as a customer creates a custom resource, this operator realizes that and will apply this change. In this case, it realized that a customer or an employee uh, wants to have um, an automation controller, so it automatically detects that and bootstrap the automation controller in the customer namespace. But is it only about, or this Ansible automation Operator, is it only about bootstrapping automation controllers, or is there more, Silva? Can you explain that to the customers? Thank you, Philippe. So we go over the bootstrap and configuration, but this is not, uh, this will be explained in the next slide. Uh, yes. So basically, the uh, Ansible automation platform operator is responsible for the bootstrapping of the automation controller. We are really talking about uh, the control plane here, and later on talking about the execution. It can also do the LDAP configuration bootstrap at the, at the start of uh, the automation controller. It does as well backup and restore for the, uh, of the database, as well as the upgrades. So every, every, every use case regarding that is actually performed by the Ansible Automation Platform uh, Operator. Uh, but, however, in an enterprise uh, environment, you want to have even more features. So we try to push the automation uh, even further using the 6AP operator. This is an internally uh, made Ansible operator that does the following. It will inject the subscription needed to actually run the automation uh, controller because you don't want every user uh, to inject that. Then we will customize the UI to make it more uh, corporate to the to six. And then we will inject as well default settings, like external logging information so that the audit logs are, uh, are passed uh, to an external logger. Uh, we will also configure other things, uh, such as uh, uh, the container groups defaults to with uh, resource management and so on. We'll go further on that. Uh, but essentially, the users will create some uh, custom resources, uh, and then they will have everything ready uh, in minutes. 
So as I said, we really uh, focused on the Ansible operator um, uh, to create this. It was used and it was created using the operator SDK. Uh, we could have done it in Golang, but here it makes more sense to use uh, Ansible. Uh, fun fact is the Ansible automation platform operator was also developed in Ansible, so it makes sense to actually use the same technology here. So now let me go further on the development and uh, how we can actually not have conflicts between the two operators. So we need to make sure with, with this operator that it will come at a later stage because it needs to have the bootstrap of the uh, automation controller. So we need to check if the status is actually ready to be used as well as if the API is also uh, up and running. Because this is really important because we inject some configuration and we will actually uh, communicate with Kubernetes or OpenShift using the Kubernetes core collection. So we have different uh, modules, Kubernetes, Kubernetes Info, uh, we can copy files, we can execute, and this helps us to actually uh, inject our configuration. But how about uh, secret management, all the secrets, because it's actually in an operator, you cannot uh, use the Ansible vault. So for that, we, uh, we were using uh, the uh, HashiCorp vault uh, plugin uh, to fetch all the secrets uh, in a secure manner. Having said that, having explained all the logic of the operators, now let's have uh, an example on how people can actually bootstrap uh, this within their own namespace in OpenShift. So in the, in the following picture, you can see this is actually uh, the deployment of the automation controller together with a standalone uh, Postgres database. You have a standalone Postgres pod, it's simply one container, and then we have the automation pod, uh, which contains four containers. One is Redis, the other one is Task, Web, and uh, EE. The, the task is responsible for scheduling all the playbooks. Uh, it's very important in terms of uh, of resources to have it properly um, uh, uh, configured. The web is for the web interface that you know in Ansible Automation Platform, and the E for the receptor. So what kind of changes can you make to the automation controller? So you need to specify uh, a custom resource called uh, automation controller, and then you can specify how many replicas uh, you want. You can specify uh, for each one of these containers how much memory and uh, uh, limits because it's important to, uh, to size it properly. You may run this into uh, an OpenShift shared cluster so you will not have infinite uh, resources. You can find more uh, uh, details on my uh, blog post on the bottom which will be as well shared in the references where I share all the knowledge regarding uh, the LDAP configuration at Bootstrap, uh, how you can actually integrate the CA uh, bundles to integrate your external services uh, within your company. Uh, yes. Then there is uh, something regarding the scheduling that I would like to share. For example, if you want to uh, schedule your, uh, your automation controller uh, within specific nodes, you can do it using labels. You can also spread them across the nodes so that they are not seated only on one specific node. That's, that's quite important. Last but not least, you can use 10 tolerations uh, to actually uh, schedule them on dedicated nodes using this concept of uh, node tainting and pod tolerations. You can find, once again, more details on, on that, having a, a, a lot of different use cases for, for, uh, uh, for, um, for this kind of use cases for customization in the reference architecture. It was published uh, during Q1 this year, so quite fresh, uh, and so on here. Yeah. But, one user will uh, definitely uh, use this automation controller, which is basically a YAML file. Uh, as we said, it will install the automation controller within your namespace. Uh, but here we have the automation part where we have developed our own Ansible operator. And here this is basically the second YAML file which you can uh, uh, create and it will automatically uh, inject uh, the license and how do we do the mapping? Well, the mapping is, uh, is on the following part. So we are actually taking the, uh, the name of the automation controller so that it knows uh, which one it can configure. And then it will inject everything uh, and um, within 10 minutes, basically. All right. 
Let's talk more about day two operations. It's good to have it provisioned, but then you want to tune it accordingly. Uh, you want to do some upgrades, you want to do some uh, backup and restore, you want to monitor the, the resources. So how, how, does we, uh, how do we do that? So first of all, the, for the upgrade, it's very simple. It's whenever you upgrade the uh, Red Hat Ansible auto, uh, automation platform uh, to a specific version, for example, in the coming month to uh, AAP 2.4, this operator is responsible for uh, upgrading all the automation controller you have in your cluster. The second part is regarding monitoring. Why so important? Because it can give you some insights. In OpenShift, for me, is if an application doesn't have this kind of monitoring, it's just, uh, I, I will just get the, the pod information and that's all. But I will not know what it does, how many jobs it runs, and so on. So for this, we have also implemented within the custom Ansible operator uh, the, the, the creation of this uh, monitoring workflow so that we can scrape uh, in real time uh, the Prometheus metrics. So what do we do? Well, we create an auditor user. This is a read-only user. We create it in automation controller. Then we actually creating a Kubernetes secret with this uh, requested information, username, password, for example. Uh, and then Prometheus uh, will need to scrap this information. In OpenShift, how do we do this? We need to enable first the uh, user workload monitoring. Uh, this is to actually monitor your own um, uh, services. And then we are actually using a service monitor. In that, we can say for each namespace, oh yeah, I want to uh, monitor this, uh, this endpoint using the Kubernetes secret. So this is done automatically for our users uh, at six. And then we can display the information in Grafana. All right, let me show you an example. So basically we have uh, two panels. The first one is basically embedded. You can actually have like for each container, uh, the resources that she's using. Here we are talking about memory uh, because we have the, a bottleneck there. And you can use the container memory working set bytes. It's basically for each container, you will know how much it consumes. And this is very important, especially in the case of automation controller because it contains four uh, containers. By default, the OpenShift uh, UI only shows the pod memory usage. So it's very hard to know, okay, which container needs more memory. On the bottom, you can see the automation controller metrics. This is the information that we just scraped uh, before on the monitoring uh, workflow. As you can see, this is highly correlated with uh, the, uh, the first panel and the number of jobs. So I'm basically displaying here uh, the running jobs in total. So uh, at the uh, speed time t, I know how much is running. Same thing for the pending jobs, uh, because there is a queue. You cannot process like you know, 10,000 jobs at the same time. Uh, it, it's queuing, so it's very important. So if you want to run more jobs in parallel, we can uh, simply increase the, the memory. All right. Uh, having said that, uh, now Philippe will take over and talk a bit about the backup and restore within uh, OpenShift, and especially in the case of automation controller. Yeah, thank you very much, Silva. So, I mean, monitoring is quite important, but what's even more important if something goes, goes wrong, a backup. And AFP, the, AFP, uh, the official um, AFP operator from Red Hat actually offers you the possibility to create a backup. It's not very well documented in the official documentation, but you can always go upstream uh, and check the AWX documentation. There you can find all the possible um, configuration settings. With the latest releases of uh, AAP, they even introduced two cool new things, and I want to highlight it quickly. So it's uh, first and foremost the, the cleanup of all, uh, cleanup backup on delete, so whenever you delete um, an AC, so an automation control, it also deletes the backup, as well as the, the PG dump, so the Postgres dump, you can modify. For example, if you have some event that you don't like to have, you can exclude them and you can save some, some space on the backup. Um, here we have the name. The name is obviously important if you want to restore it. And the backup is getting stored on a PVC. That's currently the only solution or only way to store a backup, so you can't add an S3 bucket or something like this. If you have done this backup, you can also restore it by a similar um, custom resource called Automation Controller Restore. 
There, you just have to reference to the backup you want to restore. You have to add the name of the deployment. And obviously, if you use the same name, you need to do some, sim uh, some additional steps. It's linked in the, uh, in the comments there. And depending on the size of the backup, it could take longer. Uh, so, but you can always see the, the status of the restore uh, in the status section. If that's that, back to Silma for the execution environment. Thank you, Philippe. We talked about the execution, uh, we talked about the control plane, sorry, so the automation controller. But then, we are, how about the users? They have it, but they want to run their, their playbooks. Uh, how do they do that? So we have the uh, automation execution environments. What is it? Uh, let's have a recap on that. Uh, we have basically, it's a container image. It, it's based on the universal uh, base image from Red Hat. Uh, so lots of RPMs, OS3, and so on, where you can fetch uh, to have like a command base. And then you want to add everything to run your playbooks. So we are talking about all the dependencies. Collections, libraries like RPMs or Python modules, as well as the Ansible core version. Everything together, we pack it, and then this is the image that is going to be used to run your playbooks. And so we can definitely uh, reuse that and then uh, scale it out. But how does it work in an enterprise environment uh, and disconnected? So basically, we are using Ansible Builder for this, uh, but that we will have a different approach here because we are not connected. So we need to do some customization. We are, and basically we are going to create, I mean, uh, we created already the Ansible base images within six. Uh, they, they basically contain uh, additional settings, like we have the CA bundle from six to trust their, their systems. We have the private automation hub uh, running, uh, running as well to actually fetch all the Ansible collections. Uh, we have as well, uh, regarding Python, the uh, artifactory for everything related uh, uh, to the Python modules we want to fetch, as well as uh, the UBI mirror part, where we have actually uh, everything mirrored there. So the users don't need to do anything. They will just need to uh, use our six base images, and all the dependencies will be uh, gathered from within the customer environment. Then what happens is, on OpenShift, how does it look like? So we have the control plane, as, you, as displayed here. We can see the, the resource management, like uh, the monitoring, uh, how much it uh, uses in terms of memory, and so on. And then we have the execution plane. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, this is separated. So it's not running on the same pod, it's really spinning up new pods using this new container image or these execution environments. And we are here really leveraging them as well as the container groups. What are container groups? It's basically the pod specification. Uh, you may want to mount additional volumes. You will want maybe to add more uh, memory allocation uh, to, your, uh, uh, to your container. And this is how you, uh, you would do that with container groups. So first of all, you would use execution environments and later on even customize, uh, customize them with the pod specification using container groups. All right. Now I would like to pass over back to Philippe. We'll talk more about the migration from Ansible Tower to uh, AAP2. All right. So, I mean, we have a solution now, but you also need to convince somehow the customers or our internal employees to use this new solution, right? So how does it actually look like or how fast it actually is? So the customers of our new solution can create two um, uh, custom resources, actually, one for the automation controller plus the one for the, uh, for the customization. So he can do that actually in 10 minutes if he doesn't have it already. So we already have some templates for that. If he applies it, um, of course, he also needs to migrate their own Python environments, their old Ansible Python environments, um, to execution environments. And if it's done, he already has like an environment where he can, his first, uh, can run his first job. But, and that's what Silva said before. So we introduced this monitoring stack um, to also show the customers or to give them an insight what's going on. Because if you really have like 500 concurrent jobs, you may hit some limits uh, in memory or, or CPU-wise. Um, uh, so 
it really is an iteration where you really need to fine tune new resources. But that's all you did. So it's quite simple to adapt new customers to use actually this approach. So as that said, it looks nice and it's just easy to use. But in the background, we had some challenges when introducing this new stack. And we want to just show you the recent challenges we had. So not all of them, just an, I mean, the recent and ongoing challenges. So first and foremost, we have like the Galaxy collection installed, which failed uh, with version 2.14.5. Uh, it's already fixed with the latest uh, version, which we're quite happy of it. Uh, another bug, and that was actually the trigger why we introduced the whole monitoring stack. Uh, it was that the task, um, so Ansible tasks was marked as running, but they were actually not present in the job queue. And the reason for that was that the uh, automation controller ran out of memory. But it was quite hard to detect if you don't have really a monitoring in place. So that said, these tasks are already kind of soft since we adjusted the, the resources as well as the version is fixed. But we have some other issues currently uh, we're hitting. One of them is the usage of underlying OpenShift node storage. It doesn't look that obvious, but the um, AAP operator, the automation controller, especially the task container, runs an, uh, use an empty deer for caching their jobs. An empty deer on a local disk, you can't really limit. So that could happen that your task container with the temp directory fills your node, and if you have a shared cluster, that could be quite problematic. It's an open bug, and hopefully it will get fixed uh, at some point. As well as the R source, uh, R syslog configuration, uh, which is not loaded uh, when the web container is restarted, we have there a workaround to trigger just the reload uh, with an API call. Uh, however, it's not fixed upstream, it's less, uh, just uh, a workaround we, we implemented. But even with these challenges, I mean, challenges are quite normal, uh, we also have some takeaways. With this new solution, we have like a self-service for customers, for em internal employees, to bootstrap their own environment um, under 10 minutes if they already have like the YAMLs available. They could use YAML, so they don't need to um, go through documentation. They can just use the template YAMLs um, and then bootstrap their own environment. It's fully functional in a disconnected mode as we have, uh, since we have the customization operator, which does all the job for the customers. And since it's really based on OpenShift, you have the, the, fact, uh, the, the benefits of scalable and reusable containers. If you're also interested, or if you want to have some more references, we put all the references we use during building this solution uh, on this slide. Especially the, the blog post right at the bottom, it's not used that we just have a full list of references that it looks better or not, but it's really written by uh, Silva. So if you're interested, in how we did it, also get some more code snippets out of it. Uh, it's part of this, of this blog post. Good. With that said, we come to the point where we want to open the stage to you for any questions you may have. All right. Last chance for any questions. We will also be outside, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this session. I know it's quite hard after the event yesterday, uh, but luckily we got, we got some uh, attendees. Thank you very much.